to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. And so this morning, as we gather together, we worship Jesus, and we are going to give thanks to him for his steadfast love. And so we're thankful for a love that is so unconditional and so free that Jesus would die for you and me. I mean, that's, it's incredible, the, the kind of love that God has for us and all of our weakness and sin and how much uh, the Lord has uh, sent his uh, love and grace uh, towards us and redeemed us and offer us a new life. And so this morning we come to worship. So if you'll stand with me, we'll begin, we'll pray together, we'll begin to worship together. Father, thank you for this day. God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you. We pray that you would just bless our time together as we lift up Jesus, God. There is no other name, there is no other person more important in the universe than the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that that you have sent your son, and that he has, He came to us, died on a cross for us, rose again for us, that there is new life now and forever in Jesus. So God, I pray that you would bless our time of worship. I pray you would bless our time in your word. And Lord, may all that we do glorify his holy name. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning.
Good morning. Good morning. Hey, it's great to see you guys this morning. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to be this morning. And um, I was uh, doing some research and I came across a poll that interviewed uh, Americans from all over the country, from the West Coast to the East Coast. And it was said that the top three areas of worry, causes of worry for the average American our politics, health, and money. And here's the reality. Those concerns are probably not just related to us, but every civilized society in human history has been worried about politics, health, and money. There's something about worry and something about money that are, that are connected and that find its way and plague our hearts. Well, this morning, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, is going to help us by giving us some wisdom 
as it relates to money, as, as it relates to worry. So if you'll stand with me, Matthew chapter 6, where we'll be this morning, and we'll read a couple verses. We'll read verse 24 and then verse 33. Verse 24 says this. Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Let's pray together. Father, Lord, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for the time that we have to, to, to fix our hearts and our minds on Jesus. I pray this morning that your word would, would encourage us. It would be helpful, Lord, and ultimately it would create in us a heart of trust. Lord, that we won't rely on our riches. We don't, we don't rely on the stuff that we own. Lord, we don't look to other material sources of hope. But God, we look to you and you alone. So Lord, help us this morning as we look at your word. May it speak to our hearts. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we have been journeying through the Sermon on the Mount. We've been taking this the longest sermon that Jesus has preached that we have in writing. We've taken this sermon and we've been breaking it down and walking through it section by section. And, and we get to the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus is casting a vision of what life can and what life should look like in the kingdom of God. He says, listen, this is your life now and it's full of trouble and it's very graceless. You live in a very harsh world and yet the kingdom of God is different. It's better. There's a better life to live. In me, is what he's saying. And that the grace of Jesus is available to anybody. That if, if, if you are a sinner, which qualifies all of us, there is grace and there is new life for you. And that's what, and so that's the vision he's casting here. Hey, listen, for broken people, there's a better way. There's a better life to have. It's a life that you can live now in a relationship with Jesus. It's a life that carries on forever. And what he's doing is over and over again, he's going after your heart. And because God deeply cares for your heart, Jesus addresses a subject that is near and dear to us, okay? God wants to free you from the clutches of worry by perhaps addressing outside of your own personal suffering the greatest cause of your worry, which is probably money and material possessions. So, here's what we have this morning. This is what Jesus is going to do. He's going to speak frankly to us about this subject, and here's where we're going to get started. Money and resources are gifts to be stewarded, not gods to be served. Money and your possessions, your resources... They are gifts to be stewarded. They are not gods to be served. And so let me just put this out here for us. This is, as I mentioned last week and sort of warned you last week, there was a sermon like this coming, that, that this is a sermon on money. Now, it's not just a sermon about money, because your resources include your time, your talent, and your treasure, which do include money. But... Our, and the reason why is because our anxiety, which he's going to get to, our anxiety and its relationship with money is hindering you from enjoying the blessed life that God has for you in Jesus Christ. We're going to find what that is. Now, I know probably what, you, what you're thinking. Oh, great. A sermon on money. And now, if, especially if you're a visitor here this morning, or maybe you, 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 you've not been to very many of our services here at Freedom Fellowship, let me just say, watching the line here this morning, let me just say that I have been here for more than five years now, and I have preached, on, I have preached a sermon on money three or four times, so less than one a year, okay? And, and I thought about that because I was reading in the Gospels on how much Jesus actually refers to money. And it's way more than I do. And so I thought, maybe I need to step it up and talk a little bit more about money, okay? And it's actually in almost one-third of his teaching is a reference to money in some way. Or, or, or your earthly treasures. One-third of the parables reference that. So, so what we, here's what we do. 
We walk through books of the Bible. We walk through passages of Scripture. And when we get to passages that are uncomfortable or that we don't like, we don't shy away from them. Okay? Because the word, everything in the Word is meant to be helpful for us. And that includes here. Jesus wants us to walk in freedom. And so, here's what he says to help us with this subject. Beginning in verse 19. Do not lay up treasures uh, up, up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, or, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Jesus is meddling in the, at the heart level of our lives here. What we value the most in our lives is revealed in how we steward our resources, okay? The time, the energy, the money, the, the, the stuff that we, how we spend it, how we use what we have reveals what we care most about. Someone once told me that, uh, that if you show me a person's budget, I'll show you their priorities. I've heard the same thing about business, about church. If you see a budget, you can identify what they care most about. And, and, and because you and I invest our time, energy, and money into things that we care most about, which is what Jesus says here in verse 21. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, so your heart, your heart is revealed in the stuff that you care most about, the things that you seek to protect. The things that you try to get for yourself. And that's why, Jesus says, it's not worthwhile for us to collect the toys and prizes of this world. Because everything that you love and is near and dear to you is the future things of yard sales and, gar and garbage dumps. I mean, so moths will eat those nice clothes you have in your closet. Right? And thieves can steal that fine jewelry. Now, don't, I'm not saying, and Jesus is not saying it's, it's wrong to have nice things. He's not saying it's wrong to get what you need. But he is saying there's a line that we cross into, into frivolous or meaningless uh, priorities with our time, our energy, and, our, and particularly our money. And, and, and that there are greater ways to spend those resources that God's given you. Generosity, and that's a key word for us this morning, generosity towards the work of God, God's kingdom, what God is doing, that is an eternal investment that God blesses and multiplies. And so I think about this, that in a short time, you and I will stand before Jesus. That none of us are promised tomorrow, we're not promised this afternoon. That in a short time, we will stand before Jesus. I was talking with somebody who was in his 80s. Uh, and he had had a, a, a major health a scare, and I was talking to him about life, and he said he was seven years old when Pearl Harbor happened, and I was like, what? You know, and it was incredible. I was like, do you remember Pearl Harbor? And, uh, and we're talking, and he goes, and he said, you know what's shocking to me? He's, he said, is how fast life flies by. He said, he said, I feel like, he said, Pearl Harbor was so vivid as a kid when that happened, and he said, I'm in my 80s. He said, it, 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 it goes so quick. Life is short. And so life is short. We will stand before Jesus, and we will not be in heaven. If you're a Christian, you will not be in heaven looking back and saying, man, I really wasted the time, the energy, and the resources that I spent on God's kingdom. You will, you'll never look back and be like, man, I just gave too much, or I spent too much time, or I prayed too much. That will never happen. In your, it will never happen in, in eternity. And so, it's, in fact, it's the opposite. Jesus wants us to know that money and that the, the allure of possessions can enslave your heart. That's why he's dealing with this. He wants your heart to be free. He wants your life to be free from the chains and the burdens of worry and, 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 and buy into this lie that, all, that your life is about working and working and working so you can get more stuff and you can die with the most toys at the end of your life. That's not that, that that that's slavery. You're not free, and he wants you to be free from that. He want he he wants you to understand that. Listen, all the stuff that we have, we're leaving all of it behind. That money and possessions are temporary. Moss and rust will get a hold of it. 
that, that your stuff and your bank account is not the standard, it's not the measuring stick of a successful life. That life is more than that, and yet we're enslaved, we're, we're, we're slaves to the grind. That we, we work and we grind away and we achieve and we attain and we think that if I have more stuff, I'll be happier. Or we think if I have more stuff, I'll be fulfilled or I'll look more impressive or I'll be accepted or whatever our desire is for that stuff. But ultimately, it leaves us wanting more because that new phone or house or car, it breaks down and you need something else. And so it becomes an idol that we chase after, we pursue, and we commit ourselves to it. We're always chasing and chasing and chasing, and we're never fulfilled with it. We've never, we never reach the mountaintop of having everything and being content like that. Which is why Jesus says in verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the, to, to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So something in your life is taking a back seat. Something, something is front and center, and something's taking a back seat here. And how you prioritize your, your, your possessions, your time, your energy, your money shows what that something is. And the reason that we can't serve Jesus and serve money at the same time is because they're opposites. God calls us to be good stewards, and, 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 and to be a good steward means to be a generous steward. It means to give away the very blessing and the very gifts that God has given us. But, but by serving money, you're enslaved to it, and it says more, 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 more. It's like a snowball that turns into an avalanche of more stuff. And so, so generosity and greed are, are, are Jesus is pitting that against each other. You can't go and stop at the same time. Well, you can't be generous and be greedy at the same time. That, our, that, that Jesus is getting at, again, the motive level of our hearts. So we will do some self-examination here. So you can't do both. Money is either a tool that you use, that God may have blessed you with, that you use it for his good purpose, or if you don't control your money, your money controls you. And so when we talk about money, and we, and, we, and, we, and we see things like, we see passages like this about not laying up treasures, treasures on earth, but laying up treasures in heaven. We t and Jesus is talking about generosity and, 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 and freedom in this area. And we, people will always want to know, how much do we give? How, how, where's the line of being generous enough? Okay? And some people want to know how much, how much in terms of how generous we ought to be, how much we give, because some people are, literally, are, are really trying to seek help um, in that area, and some people are trying to find a way to finagle more money for themselves, to keep more money for themselves. And so, I, so, for, so when I came to Freedom in 2018, there were some folks that, had this, that would not let this go. They had all these questions about the Old Testament tithe. And they were always there. They wanted to have meetings and talk to me about do we tithe and, and some of the language that we use and, and about our offerings and all this kind of stuff. And, and so let me just say this as we kind of carry on in, in the sermon here. People ask, are, are New Testament Christians supposed to tithe or is that some Old Testament law that doesn't apply? Here's the deal. That the good news for us is, is that, no, you can give away more than just a tenth in the New Testament. That Jesus does not tithe his blood, he gave all of his blood, right? That, that, that he creates a standard of generosity and, and a motivation of generosity in our hearts. And it's not a matter of, oh my gosh, man, the preacher, the sermon, we were told to give. No, no, no. It's like, look up to Jesus and go, wait a second, how generous is God that he gave his son for us? Right? I mean, it, I mean, shed his own sinless blood. Not a drop was left. He did not withhold any of himself. And so we think about generosity. We, I mean, we, we are called to respond with generosity as it relates to our resources. But here's the problem uh, with us as Americans that I, I believe when it comes to money. Most of us, I want you to follow me. Most of us are rich, even though we don't think we are. 
And most of us are not as generous as we think we are. Because we don't think we're rich because, because we measure our wealth by the things that we don't have. Man, well, I don't have that new computer. I don't have that car. I don't have those new set of golf clubs. I don't have uh, the, the, the finest china in my kitchen. And so we, so we go, well, I don't have a lot because I don't have the things I want. And, and, we, and we think we're generous because we measure that by our intention. Well, if I had more, I'd give more. And did you know that the poorest 20% of Americans have more wealth and have more access to goods, consume more goods than 70% of the world? Do you realize that? People living on $3 a day. And we, and we have $7 Starbucks lattes, right? That you, that you may buy two or three times throughout your day. I mean, so the poorest 20%, that's, that's, that's a stat, you, you can read that on Forbes, that the poorest 20%, Richard, has more, more access to wealth than 70% of the world. So, you have a lot more than you realize, which is why Jesus is saying, listen, if you were to take an inventory of your that God has actually blessed you with with, with with way more than you possibly understand. And all throughout the scriptures, what we have here is, is, is the Bible talking about bringing back to God what belongs to God. What God has given us. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. That doesn't just mean money, but, there, but this is also about farmers that have crops and you're bringing it to the temple. Or maybe you have... Uh, maybe you're raising sheep and that, that's used for the sacrifice at the temple or whatever it may be. That all of your resources, that your entire life is to be stewarded well. Is that we honor him by giving him the first of our lives. By giving him back a portion of our lives. I want you to imagine that here you are, you're a parent, and it's your child's birthday or maybe it's Christmas or whatever or what have you. And you buy your kid a video game console. Pick one. Xbox, Nintendo, PlayStation. Doesn't matter. Okay? You buy one. If you're an Xbox person, let's go with Xbox. So you buy your kid an Xbox. Right? I mean, what? $700? Assuming games, 50, 60, 70 bucks. Right? And, and, and you buy the Xbox for your kid to enjoy. And while your kid's playing it, you, my mom or dad, the one who bought it, Go up to your kids and say, hey, hey, can I have a turn on that? And your kid looks at you and says, no, it's mine. And you're thinking, wait a second, I will burn it in the front yard. <laughs> right? Who are you? Hey, hey, who are you, man? I'm, it, 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 it's insane because you bought that. And all you're asking for is just a portion of the time. You're, all you're asking for is just a little return. All you're asking for is just to be able to have a little use, one turn, playing the video game, right? It makes no sense. Your parent, as parents, you buy that for your kids to enjoy. When we think that everything we have and everything we make is ours, we are like short-sighted children. And I wonder, and because God is so much more loving and forgiving and compassionate than I can possibly even conceive, I wonder if there's ever a thought in there that where God says, you can't possibly believe that. I gave you what you have. That you are where you are. You are who you are. You have what you have because of me. And that what you think is actually yours has come from God. He, he, he owns everything you own. It's a gift. First Corinthians 4, 7. What have, you, what have you received? That is not a gift. Everything. Your life, your salvation, your family, the time you have, your money, the food on your table, the house you live in, the car you drive. I mean, the things that you enjoy, everything's a gift. That's why we live out of the overflow of gratitude. That's why we live out that overflow of gratitude and generosity partly is an expression of that gratitude. Is that we go, wait a second, man, it's not even mine anyway. That so, so because of that, when we realize that, it, free, it ought to free us up to be the most generous people on the planet as Christians. And so to help us see that, I, wanna, I want us to do, to do a little journey together 
I want us to take a walk uh, through a couple passages of Scripture that I believe will, will be, I hope, helpful for us as we explore more of what the Word says about this. So Paul writes a couple of letters to a struggling group of Christians in a really crazy place called Corinth. First and Second Corinthians is written, and it's written to help us as well. And so in Second Corinthians eight and in Second Corinthians nine, Paul explains uh, the reasons why we give, how we should give, the attitude we give with, uh, uh, the amount that we give with. And so I want us to begin just to kind of walk through some of this together. And there's so much more we can say that we just don't have time. So Second Corinthians eight, beginning of verse one. Here's what Paul says: writing to a church. And he references another church to give them an example. Okay? So he says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. So, hey, Christians, look to these other people. Okay? Look at their example. Look at what they've done. Check it out. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord. So, in other words, hey guys, man, you guys won't believe what's happening in the church on the other side of the country. Man, there's, a, I mean, it's made national news. These people are suffering. They're going through a hard time. That life is difficult for them, okay? That God is working powerfully there. They're, they're suffering, quote, severe tests of affliction. They don't have Cadillacs and cotton candy. That he says that it says out of their extreme poverty, out of their extreme poverty, they are joyfully generous with what little they have towards what God is doing. That these believers have financial freedom. That they are not enslaved to the grind of more stuff. That they know they possess a treasure that is greater than the treasures of this world. So, Paul says, they gave beyond their means, sacrificially. Um, Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis. Aslan was a lion. You, if you have kids, you've probably watched the movies. Uh, it's, it's, he's he's a, like this metaphor of Jesus. Anyway, so C.S. Lewis, said, the guy who did, wrote those books, said this. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There are things that we ought that we ought to like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditures ex exclude them. That's what's happening here, man. They're giving. They're like, hey, we're suffering. We don't have a lot. The Lord, hey, my life is yours. Our stuff is yours. Hey, let's let we're going all in on what you're doing. Verse four, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. So Paul had, had, had taken up an offering from this church before. And then, surprise, they write to Paul and say, Paul, hey, listen, I know we gave an offering, but can you come back? We can give a second one that's even better. Now, I have been on church staffs and been in ministry for, for over 11 years. Okay? This has never happened one time. I've never had anyone say, hey, pastor, can I, can I ask you for something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to request a song? I'll pass it along to our worship leader. You want to? You got? You can that, you know, let him pray about it. You want to do that? Or oh, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. Okay, so, so, so you want to? So you want to talk about the preaching, maybe the sermon series, and you, you want, you know, you want me to point out something or something. There's an insight there that'd be helpful to the people, and, and so, 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 some, some, some uh, information on preaching or some encouragement for preaching. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about. I, I, that's not what I, I, don't, I don't need that from you either. Okay, how, how can I help you? Can we take up another offering? Can we do a round two? Because we, I, we think we can outgive round one. I've never had it happen in 11 years of ministry. Never. I, I, I've, got, I've gotten emails about sermons, about songs, about, about kids' ministry. About, you know, I've gotten emails about outreach. I've gotten emails about a lot of things. I've never had anybody say, you know what? We ought to do another offering. Never. Never. And Paul says, man, that they're they're extreme poverty. And yet they say, Paul, come back. We want to help these, uh, we want to help through more ministry. We're going to give a second offering. That's what he says here. To help for the relief of the saints. Verse 5. And this, not as we expected. I mean, nobody, no, nobody expects that. 
not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Here's the thing about the word tithe in the Old Testament. Now, we are not bound to the Old Covenant, but the word tithe in the Old Testament doesn't just mean a tenth. We often say, well, you know, well, I'll give a tenth. Well, a tenth is a good baseline. It's a good rule of thumb for us to kind of get started. But the word tithe means first and best. Giving first, being generous, requires faith. Because giving what I have left over doesn't require any faith. It requires basic math. Right? Like I, you don't have to have a lot of faith to go, oh, I got five bucks. Here you go. But but it requires it requires faith in God that God is your provider. To give to him your very your first and your best. So in, when we give first, when we're generous, it says that they gave themselves first. When we give first, we say, Lord, I trust you that since you've given me everything I have anyway, you will keep providing for my needs. And why, why, do, we, why, why do we respond that way to God? And not, again, with money, with time, with energy, with service, with effort, with our hearts, with prayer, everything. Why do we go to God first and best? Why do we give him first and best? It's because God was first. What does 1 John 4 say? We love him because he first loved us. You love God first. Your heart didn't care about God. God loved you. God came after you. You didn't seek God. God sought you first. So, so everything we do is a response. God gave his son as an offering for sin first. God put his, his offering down first. And so we bring our first and our best here. And here's the reality. We all give to something. We give something our first and our best. It could be our house. It could be our education. It could be the car. It could be anything. Anything that, that it, what we desire most, we give our first and best to. And then what we have, what, what we have in the back seat or the back burner of our lives, we give our leftovers to. So here's a question. What, who or what is your highest priority? And, and some people have said, and I know maybe you're thinking, some, some of you are thinking this morning, man, for me to give my first and best to the Lord, I'd have to make some changes. Ding, 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 winner, winner. <laughs> yes. Because I thought you wanted Jesus to be your Lord. Comfort can be your Lord. Your, your car can be your Lord. Your, your, your stuff. You can worship your stuff. It won't help you, but I mean, but you can. You can worry. You, 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 can, you, can, you, can, you can put your trust in your possessions. But if Jesus is your Lord, then he's the one thing at the center of your life driving everything else. It, 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 Jesus change, when we say Jesus changes everything, we mean everything. Your relationship with your kids, with your boss, with your spouse. Changes, changes the way you begin to think and process key decision-making opportunities. Changes the way you deal with money. Changes the way you forgive people who have grudges against you. I mean, changes everything. He changes everything. And so if he's Lord, then he drives everything else in our lives. And so you go, man, well, I need, I need to take some time to reprioritize some things. It's no problem. He's not after behavior modification. He's not trying to change how you look on the outside. He's after your heart. He wants your heart. He wants to free your heart up. So what? So what? I mean, there, I mean, how many times have you thought you had money in your pocket and you've lost that money and, and you, had, you had a little mini meltdown? That there was, I mean, there was a time where Haley had gotten some money as a, as a, as a Christmas gift from some of her family, and I had it in my pocket, and, and we went out to the mall, and I, 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 I apparently had it. And I pulled something out of my pocket, and that money fell out. And we lost it, and I was, I was, I felt horrible for it, right? I felt horrible for that. But I mean, but I, I mean, money. I, I hope and pray money doesn't control and drive and steer the ship of my life. And so Jesus is Lord, and so it's a heart thing. Look at verse seven of Second Corinthians eight. But as you excel in everything in faith and in speech, in knowledge, and in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace as well. So you cannot separate your financial life from your Christian life. Surrendering to Jesus, when you say, when you say, Jesus, here I am, will you have me? Will you, will you 
take my life? Will you, will you forgive me? Will you, will you change me? Will you, will, you, will you make me yours, Lord? I, I believe in you. When you come to Jesus and you have the empty hands of faith, because there's nothing you bring to God that God that makes you worthy. But when you come with empty hands of faith, you, you come in a posture of surrendering yourself and saying, Jesus, I need you. I mean, I need you. I need you in my life. When we, when we do that, we don't get to separate things that we want to keep away from him. Hey, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, but don't tell me how to raise my kids. Can't do that. Jesus, heal me of my suffering, but don't tell me how to spend my money. Either we're opening all of our lives to him or we're not opening up ourselves to him. That your family, your family, your, your heart, your thoughts, the way, again, you steward things, that you as an, you, your heart, mind, body, soul, you completely belong to him. When he died on the cross to shed his blood, he died for all of you, warts and all. The good, the bad, and the ugly. To totally have all of you. And so, and so when we, that, so we don't, we don't, we don't get to, to separate, and make categories of things Jesus can touch in our lives. And so, he, but here's why we're generous. Paul says in verse nine, "For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich." Jesus enjoyed all of the riches and privileges of heaven. He voluntarily chose to sacrifice himself for the forgiveness of our sins to reconcile us with God. And it's with an unconditional love for broken people. He gives himself away to bless you with life-changing grace. And so when we see the cross in the empty tomb of Jesus, we say, wow, what a generous Savior. What a gracious Savior. And so we respond with that type of generosity. And so I want, to, I want to, I think it might be helpful here to give us some categories as we think about giving. These are from worst to best. The worst category as, we, as we, in terms of the way we think about our stuff is the category of greed. Okay? Greed says, forget you, God. This is mine. I'll spend what I want. This is my stuff. Keep your hands off of it. And the crazy thing about greed is, is that greed is so sneaky that you don't actually realize you're greedy. Nobody thinks they're greedy. Isn't that amazing? I've never had anybody say, Dustin, i got a problem. Will you pray for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, hey, how can I pray for you, man? Or woman. How, how can I pray for you? I'd love to pray for you. I've never had to go, you know, I've got this real, I've got this real problem in my life. I, I'm just, just really greedy. <laughs> never been a prayer request. I've never got it. Never. Ever. Ever. Another ever. Ever. Period. Right? I mean, it, 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 it's, so, it's so deceitful. It's so cunning. Jesus says in Luke 12, beware of greed. He'll speak up on you. Jesus doesn't have to say beware of adultery. Like, you're not tricked into that. You don't have an epiphany in, in, in where you wake up and you go, hey, hey, you don't have my spouse. <laughs> like, you need to just, like, just, just, just magically happen and you go, hey, who are you? You know, you I mean, like, you know. But greed, man, greed is deceitful. Nobody thinks they're greedy. And yet, it's the worst category. Because you, you, you think you have the right to shun God of the very things he gave you. So cunning. So cunning. The next category is, is, is we, we think that if we scratch God's back, God will scratch our back. And we think if I do a little for God, God will do a little for me. Okay, we're good. Okay. We're, 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 on, we're on a need to know basis. We, can, we, you know, we work things out. You're saying, man, I, I really want my promotion to go well. I want UT to win to beat Duke yesterday. I, you know, uh, I want uh, I want this uh, new opportunity in life. I want this relationship to pan out. Uh, I need uh, God. I need, I need I need come I need God to come through at the last minute before a major deadline. Uh, like like and so we think you know what I need God to do something for me. So if I just go and just throw in a couple bucks in the offering plate, maybe God will scratch my back too. A little quid pro quo. A little a, a little a little bit of mutual helping each other out with God. Maybe God will hook me up. But God is not interested in being a tool for you to gratify and worship yourself. Third category of, uh, as it relates to giving is it's, it's good. It's not the best, but it's good. It's return of investment. 
okay? And so you look, maybe, maybe you look at what's happening here at Freedom Fellowship and you go, you know what? Freedom looks like a good investment. That I like the worship. Uh, the kids' ministry is safe. They talk about Jesus. The youth ministry is safe. It's fun. They talk about Jesus. Um, the people at Freedom are nice. The greeters at the door are nice. There's a guy in the parking lot, big bald guy. He's got an umbrella. He's waving me down, walking me in. Okay, like I like so 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 we go. That's nice too. The preaching is tolerable. It's okay. So we'll we, I can deal with that. You know what? Free, it, the, the way they love and support the community. That's nice as well. There's they do some good things there. This seems like a good place to invest, and so you make your, you make an investment, thinking it's going to bring about a return. Not a bad thing. It honors God certainly to do that, but but there is a better category. The best category of giving is this: that Christ is your reward. That hey, listen, hey, the the, the circumstance you don't have to, you don't have to attach any stipulations to it. Like it, don't like it, whatever. Jesus is your reward. That you have been made rich through Him, so we give generously to Him. Verse ten, Second Corinthians eight, and in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you. Notice what it doesn't say. It benefits God. It benefits you. Generosity benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to also able to desire it. You know, God in heaven doesn't need your money. Do you know that? He doesn't need your money. He made the very concept of money. He man, he literally, he's made everything there is. There is nothing that exists apart from him. He doesn't need your money. God is not saying in heaven. He's not wringing his hands saying, man, I've got huge plans for all the little towns in the Lakeway area. Newport, Morristown, Dandridge, White Pine, Bainbury. I've got big plans. If only Freedom Fellowship would give a little more money. He made the sun. He, he, he. He made the moon and the oceans. So it's not to benefit God. Paul says, listen, that that generosity is to benefit one another. It's a blessed freedom that we live in because when we are generous, it shows that our hearts are, we, hey, listen, we are not enslaved to worldly treasure. Paul opens up 2 Corinthians 9, and he commends their generosity. I will echo that to you. We, I believe that Freedom Fellowship is a very generous church, okay? And I believe your generosity is wonderful. It's helpful. If we, we're able to do a lot of meaningful things, for, meaningful ministry for Jesus together. And so I'm going to commend us. Hey, like, let, let's keep going, though. But 2 Corinthians 9, in verse 6, it says, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And, and, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So in other words, you can't outgive God. What, God. what you give, God can bless and make it even more. You can't outgive him. And the more we try to hold on to our stuff with a clenched fist, when your fists are clenched holding on to your stuff, you're not able to receive the greater reward that God has. You can't receive things with, with closed fists. And so... The more we sell, the more we reap. Now, are you saying, wait a second, Dustin, are you saying more money, I, the, the more I give, the more money God will give me in return? That's not what I'm saying. Okay? It's not, just, it's not about money. We're talking about eternal impact. We're talking about, we're talking about, the, we're talking about people coming to know the love and the salvation and the life-changing grace of Jesus. We're talking about the fact that you have been given the greatest gift that anybody can ever receive. That you have been given. You have been restored to relationship with God. That, that God that God in heaven has looked down on your life and said, man, I want you. I want you. I, that, that you have all of the riches of heaven in store for you. You have, there is so much better. If, we can, if God could, could open the curtain and if God could peel it back for us to see, we would see there is so much more waiting for us later than we have right now. It would, I, it, it, would, it would humble us to the point of getting on our faces and just praying that God would, that God would, 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 would bless and God would move powerfully in this way, that God would use us like this. So I want to, so I want to talk about this in, in, in two ways, about this idea of how, of, 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 of how you reap bountifully. 
two ways. One is natural. You know, we talk about budgets and we talk about finances. And I, don't know, I guess this is a class now in high school. I think it should have been a class required for everybody when I was in high school. It wasn't. It should have been. There should have been some type of like personal accounting class. Like, I mean, I, read, I watched the ESPN documentary one time about it, like these 30 for 30s about a guy who played professional sports. And in his first paycheck from this from the pros, millions of dollars or whatever it was, like he went up to the front office and he said, "Hey, I think y'all shorted me some money." And they're like, "They're like, no, 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 you have to pay taxes out of that." And he was like, "What are taxes?" And it's like, well, "Wait a second here." Like, like I mean, we 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 should be taught at a, at a younger age about money and accountability and finances. But anyway, so let's talk about budgets and finances. If you live gener- to live gen- if you live generously, you learn to live with less than you make. That's a good rule of thumb. You live you learn you live with less than you make. That's how you always have enough. Uh, that's, that's pretty simple, right? And the re- but here's the problem though: everybody lives on a percentage. You know what percentage of your budget go- or percentage of your money goes to your mortgage, goes to your car, goes to your phone bill and your internet bill, and all these kinds of things. You, we, all, we all we all live on percentages. The problem is is we don't we don't have sometimes a good grasp on what that percentage is. That's why that's why we're like up to debt in our eyeballs. I mean, you know, like we like we don't we don't have a grasp on on, on this part. But good rule of thumb: if you learn to live a lesson you make, you you always have enough. Good rule of thumb. That's natural. But genero- listen, guys, generosity is not natural. It's supernatural. It's supernatural. There is an element where God is ready and able to get involved in your finances if you'll include Him in it. And the ultimate blessing is that he's the reward. Not that we get, not that we get stuff in return. It's that he's the reward. Jesus said Matthew, earlier in Matthew 6, when you give in secret, you'll be rewarded in secret. So what's the reward? Cash and prizes? No, you think God cares about cash and prizes? I mean, there's a trap door underneath your feet, and when it comes your time to go on to eternity, that trap door is going to open up and all your stuff's going to stay here. Right? So cash, what do cash and prizes mean? So that's not what he's talking about here. All your stuff stays. I had a, I had a family member um, who went to be with the Lord several years ago, and he wrote uh, a letter, uh, or, or like certain parts of a letter that were creating like this little memoir about his life. And he grew up dirt poor, okay? And uh, he grew up extremely poor, and he worked hard and worked himself out of poverty and made himself a very, very nice fortune. Okay, he, he, he was he was the epitome of the American dream. And before he be, he, before he became a Christian, he, he, he said in his in his journal, he said that I, he said, I used to think before I knew Jesus, I used to think that all my stuff was mine, and when I died, I'll just take it all with me. But then he said, after I became a Christian, I realized how foolish and how shallow that was. You know why? Because you've never been to a funeral and there's been a U-Haul behind the hearse. If you have, you need to talk, I want to talk to you. <laughs> I want to know how it would be awesome. Right? I mean, you, you don't take it with you. So God, so it's not cash and prizes. The reward is, is Jesus. The reward is that there are treasures laid up in heaven. There, there is life abundantly for you to experience. That we get him, the more that we're generous, the more that we say, Lord, everything I have is yours. Our, our trust increases. Our freedom increases. Our dependency upon God increases. And what happens is we enjoy more and more of his sufficiency. We find out what we really have. We find out that Jesus is enough. He is enough. So, verse 7, how much do we give? Look at verse 7, 2 Corinthians 9. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. In his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, under pressure. Okay? For God loves a cheerful giver. So how much do we give? Between you and the Lord. People see a tenth as a good place to start. But if you if you can give more, you should give more. You know what I you know what I've I and I and I'm, I've been very firm on this, and I and multiple people in the church can attest to this. I've been very firm. I have no idea what any one person in this church gives other than what me and Haley give every week. I know we give every week. I have, not, I have not one idea what anybody else gives. Or if you give at all, I have no idea. I've made it a point to separate myself. That way nobody could say anything about me knowing or dealing with finances. 
I have no idea. I do not want to know what you give. But I'm willing to say this. It's true. It may, it may be true about people here. It's probably, it's, yeah, I know it's true about just Christians in general across our country. We can give more. Because we have a lot. And so Paul says, it's not just how much we give. So how much do we give? You decide, that's been, you decide that in your heart with the Lord. Maybe, maybe I can give 15% or 20%. Maybe I've got a little extra I can give. Or maybe I give extra periodically or whatever. Or maybe, you, maybe here's the baseline. That's between you and God. I can't tell you what that is. You know where you are in your life. You know what you've got going on. That's, you, you know, the, the, the call here is to pray about it and let God lead you. I can't twist your arm into giving anything. And so, Paul says it's not just how much we give, but how we give. That's what he says here. God loves a cheerful giver. So are, when you give, are you cheerful about it? Or is it reluctant? Because if it's not, if it's not cheerful, maybe you need to stop for a moment, press the pause button, and say, man, wait a second. In the book of Hebrews says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Jesus endured the cross. It was painful, and yet he gave his life for us anyway at the cross. Why? Because he was full of joy. Why was he full of joy? Because of what it accomplished. It accomplished our salvation. It brought us back together with him. And so he, he, so he, he, he endured with joy. So we should, give, we should be generous with our lives with joy. You know, in Luke 21, Jesus is standing in the corner and he's watching the offering at church, ten bucks. He's, wa he's watching the offering, and he's not saying anything. He's not. He's not. He's not delivering a sermon at the time. In Luke twenty-one, he's simply standing in a corner and he's watching people come up and give. And there was a woman who comes up. She's a widow, and she pulls out two coins. They don't have. They didn't have folding money. They had just coins, right? They just had change. She pulls out two coins, which wouldn't even amount to a dollar. Drops from the plate, and, this, and, and and as she's dropping the plate, these, these Pharisees, I mean, they're coming by, and they're 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 they're, they're throwing in like all their you know their big jars of pennies. So everybody hears and hears it rattle and see how see how proud they are of their giving. And she just comes up, she just has two coins, she drops them in. And Jesus says, Jesus says, truly, that woman is blessed because she gave what she had. She didn't give up the excess. She didn't give up the fat. On the margin, she gave. She gave. The, she gave generously, and she gave cheerfully. Paul says, "You decide in your heart. You give cheerfully. You give what God leads you to give." You know, our, we don't take up. We don't take up an offering here with plates or baskets at our church. I mean, I, I listen. I was at a church once, and I was I was there as a, as a guest. Okay, I was there, and you had to. Maybe you've been here, but you had you had to walk up pew by pew. So you would start. The first row, there's a basket up here, and, and, and I'm sitting in the back, so I'm a guest, right? I'm sitting in the back. I'm sitting in, like, the speaker seats, right? I'm not in the back, right? <laughs> and so and so, so you walk up row by row, and, 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 and everybody's sitting down waiting for their row, and when that row got up, and they walked through, the second row would get up, and they'd walk through, and you'd give, and everybody just kind of plop, 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 give it away, right? And we're in the back, and now I don't carry cash anymore, thanks to my wife, and so I don't care. So I'm like, oh, my gosh, and I'm like, Oh boy, we got a problem here. These people are going to judge judge up the bejesus out of us, right? I'm like, we're, we're going to look not great here in a moment, right? So I'm thinking. So part of the motive was, oh no, how will people perceive me? And part of the motive was, oh no, I should carry some cash sometimes. And so, and so I was like, so we're sitting in the back row, and and I mean, row by row is going. The front rows are going. The second rows are going. We're in the back row, and I thought, Lord. Hey, we, like, we, we need one of those bread and fishes moments. You know what I'm saying? We, we, need, we, need, we need some provision right here because we're going to walk up there. We're going to stand out big time. Okay? I may see the back door. So we're, we're trying to figure out. And we're like looking. I'm, like, I'm there with some, with some people. And we're looking over like, hey, hey, you, hey you, how much money you got? You got money? You got cash? You got, hey, I got five more dollar bills. Okay, you get a dollar. I get a dollar. He gets a dollar. Like, hey, we got we to we put something in the plate. Right? Just walk up and shake past hand. God bless you, bro. You know? Like, just. No money today. Uh, so, so, like, uh, so we get up there and not carry cash. It's in our pockets. We knew if we didn't, the stink eye was going to like be be permeating through the building, right? I mean, it was awkward. And there's kind of some pressure there, some compulsion, right? You kind of go, oh my gosh, I have to give now. Everybody in this building's looking at me, right? 
real weird. But here's the thing. Here's my understanding. If Jesus is your Lord, he'll compel you to give generously. I don't, I, this, this is not a financial stick-up. It's not a hostage situation. Right? I, we're not making demands. Okay? I mean, that's not what this is. We're managing God's gifts. We're bringing him what's already his. And so here's the reward, verse 8. He is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Here's the equation. God has given his all, and we get to give some. What you find in your ongoing generosity is that God is enough. He's faithful to honor your generosity. Philippians 4.13, Tim Tebow put it under his eyes. On, on, when he played football, right? Philippians 4.13, I can do all things in, through Christ who strengthens me. You know what that verse is about? Stewardship. Read Philippians 4. Read Philippians 4, verse 10 and 19, and see what that says. Paul says, I, Paul says, I've learned to live with a whole lot. I've been rich. And I've learned to live with nothing. I've been broke. And he says, I've learned the secret to contentment in either situation. It's that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hey, whether I've got a lot or whether I've got nothing, Jesus is with me. He strengthens me. He, he empowers us to be faithful. That's, that's a reward. Verse 10. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You know, as a non-farmer, you watch seed get thrown into the ground. It's not very impressive. But you know what is impressive? When you see a field full of, har full of, full of a crop that has grown all year long, has, ma has manifested, has, has matured into a full-blown harvest, a field white full of cotton. Or you see, you, see, you see rows of crops like corn or tobacco or whatever it may be. And you go, man, you know, especially when you're driving down to the beach, like going down through Alabama. And it's like these huge fields of, of, of just massive row crops. You know, you, want, you see the seed in the ground is not very impressive. But man, a harvest is impressive. Like, how does it work? So God gives us seed so we can give it away to the ground so God can grow a harvest. Like a, like a little boy bringing loaves and fishes to Jesus. It doesn't seem like a whole lot of loaves and fishes. And he goes, here you go, sir. And he gives it to Jesus. And Jesus takes it and multiplies it and feeds thousands of people with it. You know, for centuries, Jesus has been using the generosity of other believers all throughout the world to advance the kingdom. The reason you're here today as a Christian is, is because some Christians before you got together and they stewarded their resources and planted churches and sent missionaries out and invested in copying the Bible into other languages like English so we could read it in our own native tongue. And so and the movement of Jesus that began in the, in the little town of Jerusalem spreads out into Europe and into Asia and Africa and here to America and here to East Tennessee. It's because other believer, believers before us were faithful to do the work of the ministry and, and to give. We are here, and because of our generosity, because of our faithfulness, there will be generations to come who will know Jesus. Because God has taken what little we have and God's blessed us. And the last couple of verses here, Second Corinthians, I want to read, I want to share with you this morning is verse eleven. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, that through us you, we will produce the thanksgiving to God. Enriched, in other words, peace, contentment, fulfillment. Always, God will enrich your life. Verse twelve. For the ministry of the service is not only in supplying the needs of the saints. But it's also overflowing in many thanks to God. Thanksgiving to God. In other words, it, it, we're not just giving as a, at, in a, it, just to help people, even though we are giving to help people. We're giving as an act of worship. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and your generosity of, and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all, other, all others. So when we bless people as a church, whether it be a person, whether it be a person for food, whether it be somebody who needs um, their water turned on, whether it's a, a, a child in the community or maybe kids in another country, you have a part in that blessing in their life. And that when you get to heaven, you'll have a fuller picture of how God used you to be a blessing to other people. That God uses your generosity and your time, your offerings, your serving, your mission trips, your loving your neighbor, loving your co-workers. It, all of that can be used by God to reach people so people will know the love of Jesus. And in heaven, there'll be a harvest in heaven. And there'll be countless number of people from every tribe, tongue, and language. And we'll be there. We'll go, wow, this is what God was doing. 
and we won't go, we won't beat our chest going, man, man, I really did, I, 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 I was a contributor, I made this happen. We'll sit back and go, man, how amazing is Jesus? Generosity is a sign of freedom and heart. Which is why Jesus addresses at the end of this, of Matthew 6, he connects it together with worry. Because worry is a symptom that your heart's not free. So look at what he says here. Because some of the worries that you have are about temporary material things. Sometimes you worry about suffering and about you know, you know, the future and things like that. A lot, of our, a lot of our worries come through temporary and material things. And the, the, to help some of those lessen and fade into the background. And so here's what he says. Your heavenly Father cares and provides for you. That's the point. That's the point he's about to make. Your heavenly Father cares and provides for you. Look at verse twenty-five. Therefore, now, huh? You're reading the Bible and you're going. They talk about money, and now he's talking about anxiety, and he, he connects it with the word therefore. Why, well, if you're reading that, you should ask, what is that word therefore? It's because. It's because. We're not laying up treasures on earth, we're laying up treasures in heaven. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, or what you will put on. Is life not more than food, and the body not more than clothing? Here's the connection. You've been set free by Jesus. You, you are, you've been set free to give away your resources. And you don't have to worry about being generous, because God will provide for what you need. He will provide for you, but man, I can't afford to give. You can't afford not to give. Because there's far more wealth and treasure than, than, than what you have, trust me, available to you. And so, and so, so he says you can be generous. You don't have to worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to dress, how you're, how you're going to buy your clothes. You don't have to worry about these things because the, the same God who provided you the money you have in the first place will also provide for you after you give some of it away. God's track record of provision is solid. Over and over, the Lord says, don't put your hopes in riches. Psalm 62, Proverbs 11, Proverbs 23. That's why Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not money, money's not evil, money's a tool. The love, the lust, the all-consuming desire for it is. And which is why he says, as for the rich person, this is in this is 1 Timothy 6, 17, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, to be prideful, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. He goes on to say, man, you should, they, you should, be, you should, you should be rich in good works, be generous, ready to share, storing up treasures in heaven is a good foundation for, for what is ahead in the future. That when your hope is in your money, your hope is in your stuff, and if it's not in the Lord first, you will have a lot of anxiety because your money will either disappear or let you down. Your stuff will disappear or let you down. So, and so money's not the end-all, be-all. So, so don't put your hope there. Of course you're anxious because that's where your hope is. Jeff Bezos is the rich, who's got a gazillion dollars. Jeff Bezos is the richest man in the world said that he's trying to invest large sums of his money into, fi into finding a way uh, to create or to find the, a, a fountain of, uh, of eternal youth. And he said the reason he's investing in that is because he doesn't want to die. Hey, i got bad news for you. Your money cannot stop you from dying. Your money can't save you. Your money can't do what only God can do. Forgive your sins, solve your problems. And so men are saying, that's when we're human. And we do worry. Yes, we do. We do worry about money and clothes and comfort. That's what Jesus, that's what Jesus is trying to help us. Hey, listen, you can be free from it. You can give it away, be free from it. Trust in me, and, you, and there will be a peace that surpasses all understanding. Look at what he says in verse 26 as we close this morning. Look at this. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour of, 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 to his span of life? And, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. In other words, they don't work. And yet I tell you that even Solomon, King Solomon, the one who built the temple, King Solomon, 
In all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So if, go, if God clothed the grass of the field, which today which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how, how will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, meaning talking about unbelievers, unbelievers seek after these things. For your heavenly Father knows what you need, knows that you need them all. So what do we do? We don't, we don't have to obsess and worry. What do we do? Verse 33, we trust the Lord. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. He'll take care of you. He's provided for you. That, that, he says in verse 34, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is the day for its own trouble. True freedom is knowing that, that God richly provides for his kids. I'm not saying planning is unimportant, but to say that you should just worry. Worry is not beneficial. I was, I, and I'm, I'm reminded of the situation where Haley and I, I was a part-time, I had a part-time job at, on a church staff, and we didn't have a lot of money, and um, and uh, and I was paying for school, and I, I, because of a lack of trust, honestly, I looked at Haley and I said, I don't, I don't know if we can afford to give this week off in this church. Maybe we can, maybe when I get paid we can double up, but I can't I can't afford it. We can't I can't afford to do it. And I was so worried about how to pay for school and, and tuition was due, and we had to pay all of our bills. And I and I, again I'm part time, and I'm like I don't know how we're going to make this work. And, and I said I, I don't th I don't think we can do it. I was I was stressing out over it uh, quite a bit, and Hadley said, No, we are going to give. We're going to, and we're going to trust God that God will give us what we need. And so we showed up and we and, and we gave anyway, and we didn't have we didn't receive uh, a lottery check in the mail. But what we found was is that God provides for what we need; that His provision is enough. And and here in this situation, as it pertains to us, we can choose trust over worry. If God cares for the birds of the air, the flowers of the field, how much more does God care for you? His own blood-bought children through his own through, through, through the sacrifice and the cross of Jesus Christ. You belong to him by the shed blood of Jesus. If God cares for birds and flowers, he cares more for you. You, you, can, you can live free, unattached to this world and all of its treasures. Because God is a good father who sees you, knows you, cares about what you care about, and he provides for you. He has, he is, and he will. You're that important to him. So worry and greed cannot fix your problems. The God who spoke galaxies into being, who has made a million sunrises, the God who holds the world in his hands, holds you in his hands. You can be free. That's how you can give faithfully and not worry. It's how you can love boldly and not worry. It's how you can live freely and not worry. It's because God is good and he will give you what you need. So this morning, as we come to a time of invitation, let's ask the Lord to give us a desire to seek him and to trust him a little bit more. He be glorified, and may we see that ultimately it's, it'll be for our good and for the good of other people. Will you stand with me? This morning, Jesus is really calling you into a life of freedom from the very things that want to lock you up and hold you down and hold you back from really experiencing the grace and the power and the peace of God on greater levels than you have may possibly before. And so right now, if, you, if you're not a believer, if you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, here's the, here's the gift, the provision, the treasure he's given you, is that you can receive the salvation that Jesus has, has purchased. He bought it with his own blood. His blood was, was given in exchange for ours. We can be forgiven of our sin. We are not held, we are not held liable to. We could have a
brand new life, a new start. We can be, we can have a life that lasts forever with God because of what Jesus has done. He's provided all, He's paid it all, and we receive it freely. So if you're not a believer today, would you come and know the free gift of God's grace to forgive your sin and change your life? And that prayer this morning is a simple prayer, praying in faith, believing, trusting that Jesus is Lord, believing he died on the cross and he rose again for you. It's simply to say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need you to save me. A simple, short prayer like that, believing in him can change your past, present, and future. If you're here this morning and that's you and you want to talk more about that, I would love to talk with you and pray with you up front to your right. And if you're here this morning and you're a believer, you're a Christian, and maybe you're struggling, maybe you're struggling with generosity, maybe you're struggling with worry about your stuff, there's freedom in Jesus. He has gotten you to the point you are today. He took care of you yesterday. He brought you here. He'll take care of you today. You can trust him with everything in your life. And if there's something holding you back, there's an anxiety, there's a worry, there's a burden, would you, in this, as we sing, would you lay it down before the Lord? And ask God that you can experience his peace that surpasses all understanding. Will you trust in his provision? Will you seek him first and offer your life to him first? Father, we come before you. God, we're grateful for every, every act of love. We're thankful for your love for us. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your word. I pray that it would help us. God, it would guide us. Lord, I pray for the person who doesn't know Christ. May today be the day you save them and change their heart and their life. And Lord, for us, your people, God, would you help us in the area of our resources. May we trust you and trust you and trust you. You are our faithful provider. You have been and you will be. So may we, may we just get honest with you now as we sing. We pray all in Jesus' name. Amen.
who we are and we have what we have is of you. Not because we earned it or worked for it or deserved it. Because, you know, we certainly have not. But we thank you that you have been so generous to us. Lord, we honor you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for just a moment. Let me just say thank you so much for being here this morning. As we get ready to dismiss, I want to I want to I want to turn your attention. You got the sermon notes in the back of the sermon notes. There are some, there's a lot of things coming up. Uh, Easter egg hunt is on April the first on Saturday uh, for kids for our kids. It's going to be at uh, here in Mock Pond, just a, on, a, on a little on a, a Heather and Adam's little farm. Um, and so uh, we had it there last year. It was awesome. Pray for good weather. But we, all, we need Easter egg candy. And so if you would like to donate or, or give some, you can drop it by Wednesday night. Uh, you can bring it uh, even next, you can even bring it next week. Saturday, you can bring it sat, next Saturday. Saturday we're having a, a brunch, a couple, a couple hours. We're going to stuff Easter eggs. And there'll be some food provided. And that'd be a great opportunity just to fellowship and get that ready. But that, but that information is here. That brunch is from 9 to 11 next Saturday. And Easter egg hunt is on April the 1st. So uh, I would encourage you to look at that. Man Day Monday is next Monday, not tomorrow, next Monday, same time and place at the Wright's House, 6 p.m. Uh, and we look forward to a time of fellowship and encouragement and prayer. And then I would just encourage you as well. Um, our, we're, we're, doing, we're having our Good Friday and Easter services as we normally do. I would encourage you to pray. On Good Friday night, we'll have a special service, a, a time of worship and, and uh, scripture and communion. As we celebrate the, the crucifixion of Jesus, will you, will you begin to pray for that? And, uh, and, and also, be praying for our Easter service. Pray about who you can invite to come and, wor and worship the risen Lord with us on Easter. So uh, all that information is on the back of, the, uh, back of the notes. If you didn't pick it up, there's some extra out there. So, okay. Speaking of offering, baskets up here, drop boxes on the way out. You can get to freedomwhitepine.org forward slash give. Okay. No one's told you this morning. Jesus loves you. We do too. I'm glad you're here. We stand. Father, thank you again for every every gift. Lord, I pray that this week as we go to work, as we go to school, as we go to as we go out there out in our communities, Lord, wherever you send us, Lord, may our light shine brightly for Jesus. And may you use our lives to have an impact in someone else's life. And this week, may you draw our hearts closer to Jesus. And Lord, that we would enjoy more and more of our relationship with you. So Lord, would you watch over us, protect us, and use us for your glory. We pray all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's sing it out. There's only love.
Where's that uh, where we change it to the music? The music. What's the I couldn't remember, I just hit the all music? of music? Yeah. Yeah, it's the you gotta make sure that uh, these four are good. Okay. And once you put this in there, then this is the bottom of the Brother, I'm, I gotta run. All right, man. We'll see you, man. Yeah, we'll see you next weekend. No doubt, bro. You did a good job, man. Thank you. It was less true. No doubt. No doubt. You get used to it. Thank <laughs> you.